The subcommittee will come to order. Uh, without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the subcommittee at any time. Without objection, members of the full committee not on this subcommittee are authorized to participate in today's hearing. As a reminder, I ask all members to keep themselves muted when they are not being recognized. The staff ha have been instructed not to mute members except when a member is not being recognized and there is inadvertent background noise. Members are also reminded that they may only participate in one remote proceeding at a time. If you are participating today, please keep your camera on and if you choose to attend a different remote proceeding, please turn your camera off. This hearing is entitled Build to Last, Examining Housing Resilience in the Face of Climate Change. <clears throat> I now recognize myself for four minutes uh, to give an opening statement. <clears throat> Today, we will examine effects of climate change on America's housing infrastructure, and within the jurisdiction of this subcommittee, the role of the federal government in mitigating, responding to, and recovering from weather events. Climate change is the busy, business, the biggest existential crisis of our time. Scientific data demonstrates that the average global temperature is trending upward and that more record-setting or near-record-setting temperatures are likely on the horizon. According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, last year was the second warmest year on record behind 2016, and 10 of the warmest years on record have occurred since 2005. Rising global temperatures associated with widespread changes in weather patterns and scientific studies indicate that extreme weather events such as heat waves and large storms are likely to become more frequent or more intense with human-induced climate change. The federal government estimates the occurrence and cost of weather and climate disasters uh, and last year set a new annual record for disasters with 22 weather or climate disasters in the United States exceeding $1 billion in losses. 2020 was the sixth consecutive year in which 10 or more billion dollar disasters have impacted the United States. As people in every state and territory in the United States remain concerned about climate change impacts, the, the impetus is on federal policymakers to be diligent in supporting resilient and prepared communities and to prioritize areas that are most vulnerable to climate risk, including low income neighborhoods and communities of color. We will talk about more of that when we get into the question and answer period. Uh, and now I would like to uh, reserve one or uh, present the uh, ranking member uh, for one minute. But before I do, I want to just uh, thank uh, uh, ranking member Stivers for the opportunity to work with him over the uh, past few years. Uh, he's been on this uh, committee since he was elected to Congress. I have enjoyed working with him. I'd like to thank him for his uh, civility and his decency. Uh, I wish him very uh, uh, much uh, success in his new uh, job. And um, we, we, we hope that uh, you will remember us uh, when you enter into the land of great wealth and opportunity and mansions and uh, expensive cars. So uh, ranking member Stivers, you're now recognized for one minute. Well, thank you, Chairman Cleaver. I appreciate you calling this hearing today and I appreciate a chance to uh, chat with you. As, as you noted on a, on a personal note, it's a bittersweet moment for me because this is the last uh, hearing as ranking member of this subcommittee before I leave Congress in a couple weeks. And uh, as I reflect on my time in Congress, I'm proud of the work we've done together and there's a lot more that I hope uh, that all of you will continue to work on. It's been an honor to work with you, Mr. Chairman, and. and the members of both the majority and minority. I've enjoyed working with everybody. And the good news is I'm just taking another job. I'm not dying. So I'll still be around and plan to be in Washington a decent amount. And I still care about these issues. Uh, you know, getting back to the topic of today's hearing on resiliency, I think it is important 
that we tackle the issues of making our housing stock as resilient as we can from natural perils. And I think it's really uh, interesting to note that uh, Congress has enacted two five-year reauthorizations of the National Flood Insurance Program since 1994, only two, once in 2004 and once in 2012. There have been short, there have been 16 short-term extensions since 2017. And I hope my colleagues will work in a bipartisan manner to actually, um, you know, get something done. I know last year we negotiated a bipartisan bill that, that uh, came out of this committee, but didn't advance. And so I am hopeful that uh, you'll continue the bipartisan efforts uh, around resiliency. And the big part of that in this committee is the National Flood Insurance Program. And there's a lot we need to do that I plan to, to talk to our witnesses about. We need to do a better job on the mapping. 3D mapping is an imperative if we're gonna figure out uh, how to deal with resiliency. And we have to figure out how to deal with uh, claims that are filed multiple times on the same property. And I think uh, there need to be some uh, ways to deal with that. I think mitigation is so important and the mitigation efforts uh, are really as important uh, as what you do inside the flood insurance program itself. So uh, I hope my colleagues will keep these issues in mind. Uh, there's a lot to do. Uh, moving forward, and I look forward to being an outside ally that uh, you can count on to continue to make things uh, work and move things forward. Uh, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your uh, civility. Thanks for uh, your great partnership, and uh, I look forward to working with you from the private sector. Uh, maybe I'll be wearing a better suit, but I look forward to working with you in, in an ongoing basis. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, General Stivers. Uh, the uh, the uh, ranking, the, the chair of our overall committee, the Financial Services Committee, full committee, uh, is not here at, at this moment. Uh, but uh, I want to make sure every, all members know that whenever she arrives after the who, after the speaker, who may be uh, uh, recognized at the moment, I will recognize. Uh, the um, ranking member for uh, such time as she may consume. <clears throat> and now let, let's uh, get on with the introduction of those who are uh, going to uh, be uh, with us today as witnesses. Um, let me uh, uh, give uh, Al Green, a member Al Green, the opportunity to introduce uh, our first witness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I greatly appreciate this opportunity. Our first witness is a former city council person who uh, went on to be a state senator, who is now a county commissioner, who is very well um, learned and knowledgeable about these issues associated with CDBGDR. And I'm honored to introduce and present to everyone uh, Commissioner Rodney Ellis. Thank you, uh, uh, Thank you Congressman you. Green. My... Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> uh, let me introduce all of the witnesses, uh, and then we will move toward the uh, question and answers after the uh, chair comes in. Uh, we have also with us today uh, Arananda M. Gardo Obert. Uh, Mr. Andrew N. Mayes, the Commissioner of uh, the Connecticut Department of Insurance on behalf of the National Association of Insurance. Shelley Patacha, uh, Chief Climate Strategist, uh, and uh, Stephen Ellis, President of Taxpayers for Common Sense. Uh, we will uh, proceed with the statements beginning with uh, Commissioner Rodney Ellis. Thank you, uh, Chairman Cleaver, uh, and a ranking a member uh, Stivus as well, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you, Congressman Al Green, for your friendship over, over many years. I'm proud to testify today. I am Rodney Ellis. I represent about 1.1 million people in the third largest uh, county in the country. City of Houston is our county seat. Um, we have a total population of about 4.6 million people in our county. Harris County uh, residents have long dealt with flooding and natural disasters due to our location near the Gulf of Mexico, our flat topography that barely rises above sea level. 
However, climate change is now adding a new level of urgency by increasing frequency of extreme weather events. In 2017, Harvey devastated this region. This hurricane dropped more than 50 inches of rain in some parts of Houston, causing more than 100 deaths, resulting in $125 billion worth of damage in the Gulf Coast region. Our residents are still dealing with the impacts of Hurricane Harvey. According to a University of Houston study, nearly 20% of the residents who were displaced by the storm are still in temporary housing. Natural disasters uh, such as Harvey exacerbate pre-existing structural inequalities. A study by Rice University and University of Pittsburgh found that between 1999 and 2013, natural disasters increased Houston's racial wealth gap by $87,000. Time and time again, the poorest neighborhoods in Harris County are the hardest hit during storms, floods, and other natural disasters but they receive the least amount of resources to recover, rebuild, and build resiliency against the next flood. The federal cost-benefit ratio flood standards for mitigation projects are based on property values rather than historical impact and ability to recover, which means low income, oftentimes black and Hispanic communities like Fifth Ward, uh, where Congressman Nikki Leland and Congresswoman Barbara Jordan hail from, have passed, have been passed over for federal funding for years, despite extreme uh, flood protection in the area. This creates a cycle where those in higher income neighborhoods get access to funding for new projects, while certain neighborhoods continue to suffer from disinvestment. By prioritizing property over people, areas of high income values and fewer people are often selected over areas with larger populations living in expensive homes, even if they, if they are at higher risk of flooding and greater damage to protect people in those communities. The state of Texas receives $4.2 billion from the Department of Housing and Urban Development Community Block Grant Mitigation Fund, uh, which, which is administered by the state through our general land office to address infrastructure and build and implement structural and non-structural projects, programs and partnerships that reduce the risk and impacts of future natural disasters. Although my county is very grateful for the sizable federal investments, there are significant shortcomings in the administration of these programs, both at our level on the state level and the federal level. On the CDBG block grant discovery programs, an Urban Institute report found that implementation challenges and slow timelines are a problem. On average, programs took about 4.7 years to complete across all activity types and 3.8 years to complete across housing activities. This is reflected in several year delays at the General Land Office in Texas for disbursement of funds to Harris County. The slow response from the state's GLO to allocate and disperse funds means that communities are desperately waiting for help to rebuild their homes and lives years after Hurricane Harvey. Reducing the risk of harm from future flood requires bold control of infrastructure, policies, and regulations. Following Harvey, we successfully advocated on the county level for equity guidelines on how we disperse, dis disperse flood infrastructure and recovery projects. We passed a $2.5 billion bond package, which was approved by our voters in 2018. When we prioritize the most vulnerable, our investments create a big impact and bring more benefits to more people. As my written testimony has outlined, there are many challenges on the road to full recovery from Hurricane Harvey and preparing for future storms that we know will come more frequently. But there are steps that this subcommittee and HUD can take to support communities like Harris County and all across our country. The Texas Government General Land Office needs more oversight. So do we. It's a good thing for you to come back and ask, what are we doing with the money you gave us? To provide more transparent, comprehensive information on the approach that money is being dispersed through CD, CDBG block grants. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'll just add, uh, I'd like to submit a letter to the record as well from my housing office. I just want to have some answer your questions. Thank you. Without objection, thank you, uh, Commissioner Ellis. Uh, <clears throat> next, uh, we have uh, with us uh, Ms. Adriana Ardonu uh, Godo Arbear.
and, and I apologize. Would you please just to help me pronounce your name as you begin your comments? Of course, certainly. Um, share ranking members and other members uh, of the subcommittee, thank you for the invitation to testify. I am Ariadna Godrobert, uh, founder and director of Ayuda Legal Puerto Rico. Um, since 2017, we lead legal support and advocacy efforts around disaster recovery in the island. Almost four years of disasters bring us closer to a climate, housing, and infrastructure crisis that threatens the possibility of life in Puerto Rico. 12% of the population has left in a decade. 24% of our people lives in high to high medium risk zones. Addressing so affecting addressing effective disaster planning and response, affordable and resilient houses is urgent. Families who were not able to access FEMA, who were turned down or neglected by Togar Renace, a STEP program, were brought into the repair, rebuild, and relocate CDBGDR program administered by our local Department of Housing. Between July 2019 and January 2020, 27,000 families applied. As of today, only 900 houses have been repaired and 45 rebuilt. A new hurricane season starts in 26 days. We need disaster assistance to arrive quicker. We need guidelines to ensure coherent planning, equitable access to funds, displacement minimization and participation. We need flexibility. Disaster assistance should not be a blind bet on possible outcomes, but a strategy towards sustainable recovery. And federal and local governments share the responsibility to lead survivors to resiliency. We need CDBGDR to be permanently authorized. The wait for allocation notices is excruciating. Mitigation funds destined to PR were made available almost 24 months after the appropriation. Permanent authorization could also deter political actions to delay funds, such as those experienced by Puerto Rico and that were grounded on a complete disregard for the lives of 3 million people in the island. Permanent authorization could pave the way for agility, for model policies. It could provide a core set of guidelines to, to stop what's happening in Puerto Rico where significant restrictions are locally imposed. Title clearance should never be a condition for disaster assistance. Half of the people in Puerto Rico lack a formal title. While local laws do not require a deed and federal disaster regulations provide a broad definition of ownership, FEMA's incorrect interpretation excluded 77,000 families from receiving assistance. Ayuda Legal drafted an alternative title declaration and we advocated for FEMA to stop barring assistance and we won, but it was too late. FEMA's reluctance to notify applicants about their right to appeal and use the declaration placed on the backs of nonprofits the responsibility to let survivors know about these rights, and we couldn't do it. Later, the local Department of Housing decided to require titles to repair, rebuild, and relocate using CDBGDR funds. Thousands of applications were transferred to an unnecessary, vague, and costly title clearance program, delaying evaluations for months and years. Eventually, we attained an executive order waiving title requirement to repair, to repair and rebuild, yet the Department of Housing requires title to relocate. With $1.1 million dispersed, only two titles have been registered. Proof of title has been an obstacle in California and North Carolina as well. Recovery processes would benefit from clear and inclusive definitions of ownership. Title issues will not be solved by disaster programs or legal aid. They require policy changes at local levels. Guidelines could also prevent displacements. Despite of mitigation funds, our CDBGDR plan has an across-the-board prohibition to rebuild in flood zones. These families in flood zones are only able to relocate. These relocations are never voluntary. Four years after a disaster, a low-income family without a safe dwelling would have no choice but to relocate if the alternative is to receive no aid at all. We need sensible relocation policies that account for the needs, wants, and human rights of communities. Relocation should never be the first option. We need mitigation and, and anti-displacement policies. Mitigation can be effective, save funds, and address climate change. Yet, wrongly applied, mitigation may also displace and worsen inequitable development. Lastly, participation is essential for the success of recovery. Sustainable solutions require acknowledging the power and agency of local stakeholders. Regional civilian oversight committees, facilitated by in independent individuals, never the, never the Department of Housing staff, must be promoted. Coherent and participatory planning is equally essential. One of the biggest obstacles for needs assessments and resilient housing infrastructure is that CDBGDR planning programs have barely started. 
HUD core guidelines should instruct grantees to publish timelines, to publish progress reports, and to prioritize participatory planning. A just recovery is not only needed, but it's possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have, I have Ms. Andrew Mays, Commissioner of Insurance uh, for uh, Connecticut, uh, testifying on behalf of the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. You're now recognized for five minutes. Chairman Cleaver, Chairwoman Waters, uh, Ranking Member Stivers, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the invitation to testify today. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for speaking to our NAIC members recently. We do appreciate the subcommittee's efforts to focus on disaster risk reduction and resilience. Perhaps no sector is more attuned to and focused on disaster preparedness and directly aware of its value than the insurance sector. State insurance regulators recognize that natural disasters take a considerable financial and emotional toll on Americans every year. Climate risk contributes directly to a growing coverage gap between what the insurance industry can cover while balancing availability and affordability in what is required. It is estimated that on a global basis, the insurance industry's share of natural disaster losses is only 36% of the total required. So mitigation is critical to help close that gap. We are working to find solutions to managing the catastrophic risk exposure in our respective states and through the NAIC have been engaged in those efforts for decades. I serve as a member of the NAIC's Climate and Resiliency Task Force, and we are focused on five areas, pre-disaster mitigation, solvency, climate risk disclosure, innovation, and technology. Now, as part of those efforts, insurance regulators are participating in multi-agency stakeholder educational efforts on pre-disaster mitigation related to climate risk, and incentivizing insurer recognition of enhanced building codes in underwriting and in pricing. In March, the NAIC hosted a building code and mitigation workshop with state insurance departments, FEMA, insurance industry representatives, and consumer groups. Now, risk reduction and mitigation to protect consumers and reduce the losses paid by insurers or otherwise absorbed through federal spending. That helps to maintain solvent insurance markets while keeping rates more affordable. State insurance regulators are examining the potential solvency impact of insurers' exposure to climate-related risk, and we may consider enhancements to our regulator solvency tool to analyze and address an insurer's potential financial exposure to the physical and to the transition impacts of climate change. We're also focusing on climate risk disclosure and considering modifications to our existing NAIC climate risk survey to promote uniformity in reporting requirements. Now, in addition, we're considering innovative solutions to climate risk and resiliency directed at reducing, managing, and mitigating climate risk while closing insurance gaps and in coverage for consumers. And finally, we have established a work, strop, a work stream, sorry, focused on the increasing use of technology to better assess and evaluate climate risk exposure. You can think of predictive modeling tools, for, for example. The NAIC Center for Insurance and Policy Research has also been active in researching various aspects of resiliency. We recently held an event in coordination with the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety on the insurance implications of severe convective storms, and that included a live demonstration of the importance of building resilient standards. State insurance regulators also have a collaborative relationship with FEMA, and we are jointly hosting resilience roundtables across the country on resilience priorities before, during, and after disaster events. Some states have formed a regional resilience working group with FEMA that's focusing on lessons learned from 2020 in advance of the upcoming hurricane season. Further, we have established a FEMA NAIC advisory group to coordinate resilience activities between state regulators and FEMA. And we, the NAIC and FEMA, are also working on a regional earthquake training exercise. Last, but certainly not least, state insurance regulators recognize the pivotal role that flood insurance plays in preparedness and recovery. We urge Congress to pass a long-term NFIP reauthorization before it expires on September 30th to provide certainty for policyholders. Reauthorization legislation should focus on ways to encourage investment 
in flood mitigation and ensure consumers have access to multiple options for flood insurance products and to help facilitate greater growth in the private flood insurance market as a complement to the NFIP. Uh, in conclusion, state insurance regulators share your support for investing in prevention and preparedness to help minimize the impact of natural catastrophes and economic loss. Pre-event disaster planning, effective mitigation, and rational building codes are crucial parts of the solution. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I would be pleased to take your questions. Thank you, Mr. Bayes, for your co uh, comments uh, to us. Uh, and now we recognize Michelle Poticia, who was the Chief Climate Strategist at the National Resources Defense Council. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Chair Cleaver, Chair Waters, Ranking Member Stivers, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today about housing and climate resilience. My name is Shelley Potisha, and I am the Chief Climate Strategist for NRDC, the Natural Resources Defense Council, NRDC is an international nonprofit environmental organization working to protect the world's natural resources, improve public health, and ensure a safe and sustainable environment for all. The impacts of climate change, extreme heat, powerful storms, sea level rise, are already impossible to ignore. We now quite undeniably live in a rapidly changing world that will profoundly impact our nation and our society. Over the last several years, we have seen record-breaking hurricanes, floods, wildfires, other climate fuel disasters that have devastated communities and caused untold suffering for millions of Americans. The impacts of climate change are here and they will continue to grow in severity and frequency, even under the most optimistic climate mitigation scenarios. Faced with this reality, we must prepare for a dramatically different future and ensure that we protect the people and communities who are most vulnerable. We must also think about how we make decisions and who is involved in making those decisions. The complex and daunting challenges posed by climate change already exacerbate the intergenerational harms of racial and economic inequality. The people who bear the greatest burdens of climate change too often are also locked out of decision-making that will shape the future of their communities. I want to bring to the subcommittee's attention three actions to address issues at the intersection of equity, housing, and climate resilience that could form the basis of a new federal direction. First, support community-led development and fund community ownership. Community-led development that is both equitable and sustainable is an approach that can be successfully employed and is critical to building lasting change. This approach, sometimes known as low carbon resilient development, brings together traditionally separate goals, reducing emissions, becoming more resilient to climate change, and economic and social development. Projects coming out of the Strong, Prosperous, and Resilient Communities Challenge, or SPARC, use this approach and have been created with and by community leaders. They promote equitable transit, housing, green infrastructure. They safeguard against displacement caused by gentrification, and they stimulate local microeconomies. SPARC can provide a model for a more resilient future. Second, in addition to fully funding CDBG, which targets historically disadvantaged communities of color with vital resources and technical assistance, Congress also needs to permanently establish in statute the Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery Program and use it to model community-led low-carbon development. Because CDBGDR is not permanently established in statute, each new authorization an appropriation requires HUD to go through a lengthy and time-consuming process of drafting and approving a new set of regulations. The result is at best a month-long delay between qualifying disasters and delivery of assistance. Why not embed the principles of community-led, low-carbon resilient development into a permanent CDBGDR and raise the bar for recovery going forward? Finally, reform the National Flood Insurance Program. I urge the committee to quickly move forward to reform 
from the National Flood Insurance Program. Much more than an insurance program, NFIP serves as a critical source of information for individuals and communities about flood history and flood risk. The right reforms could allow NFIP to be a linchpin in our efforts to cope with the growing problems of flooding and sea level rise that result from climate change. But currently, it's a liability. We need, to, uh, we need an NFIP that provides low and moderate income people with affordable coverage, expands access to flood mitigation and relocation assistance, and grants homeowners, home buyers, and renters a right to know the flood history and risks associated with their current or prospective home. President Biden's Americans Job Plan will create good paying jobs and build, preserve, and retrofit millions of homes to be more affordable and resilient. These are important steps toward building a more just, equitable, and climate resilient future. Your committee can take it even further and make it sure to be the direction going forward. I thank you for the opportunity to speak before the subcommittee today. Thank you, Ms. Patricia. Uh, and finally, we have Steve Ellis, who is president of Taxpayers for Common Sense. Uh, Mr. Ellis, you have five minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Waters, Chairman uh, Cleaver, Ranking Member Stivers, members of the subcommittee. I am Steve Ellis, president of Taxpayers for Common Sense, a national nonpartisan budget watchdog. Thank you for inviting me. TCS has worked on disaster related issues on behalf of taxpayers for our entire more than 25 years of existence. And I've been involved in flooding issues dating back to my days as a young Coast Guard officer dealing with the aftermath of the great Midwest flood of 1993. These are critical issues for taxpayers and the country needs smart public policy that protects people and property. The Congressional Budget Office estimates that hurricane winds and storm related response cost the US economy $54 billion annually, including $34 billion in expected annual economic loss to the residential sector. The expected annual cost of federal taxpayers is estimated to be $17 billion. From agriculture to defense to transportation, climate change impacts our entire federal budget, but no area of spending so directly mirrors the escalating climate change crisis as disaster spending. On a cost-adjusted basis, billion-dollar disasters in the U.S. have increased from 2.9 per year at an average cost of $17.8 billion in the 1980s to 16.2 disasters per year at an average annual cost of $121.4 billion from 2016 to 2020. The Congressional Budget Office puts it rather succinctly, climate change increases federal budget deficits, and that Investment by the government or others in various types of mitigation or efforts could reduce the cost of climate change. One other truism of disasters is that they have a disproportionate impact on poor and minority populations. In many cases, these individuals don't have savings to rely on when they, while they rebuild. They may have lost their transportation to work and their place of business may have been destroyed as well. Because of historically discriminatory policies or a need for lower housing costs, these individuals are often situated in less desirable, more vulnerable, higher risk areas. They may not be able to repay loans made available after disasters or provide sufficient funds of their own to tap federal programs. There are roughly 5 million NFIP policies, but there are well over 100 million housing units in the US. More people need to purchase flood insurance. After 2016's extraordinary uh, heavy rainfall event in Baton Rouge, the average homeowner with flood insurance coverage got $86,500 to rebuild their home. The average person without flood insurance got only $9,100 in disaster assistance. Programs such as CDBGDR should take into account the needs of disadvantaged populations and ensure that they have access to the benefits, but also the tools to mitigate, adapt, and pre-spawn to future disaster events to make them less costly and impactful. While it varies by situation and peril, we know that every dollar spent on mitigation can save as much as $6 or more in post-disaster response. Regardless of need, NFIP has subsidized rates since its inception 50 years ago. More than 25% of properties in the program pay subsidized or grandfathered rates. NFIP has helped fuel a development boom in high-risk areas simply by making it more affordable to take on flood risk. And housing doesn't occur in a vacuum. As areas uh, develop, infrastructure follows with roads, bridges, water, electric, and sewer, and all these intensify along with re residential development. The NFIP has exacerbated exposure to climate change, 
At the same time, it is negatively impacted by it. As storms increase in frequency, as sea levels rise, this increases the cost of the program. It also increases demand for CDBGDR. The best way to reduce the rate for flood insurance for property owners and taxpayers is to reduce the risk. It's not about artificial caps that hide the real risk to people, but about finding ways to fund mitigation either at the property or the community level. If a property owner is unable to afford the premium, means-tested assistance outside the rate structure should be provided. FEMA's new risk rating 2.0 promises to better pack price actual risk for properties by incorporating more data and flood variables to determine actual risk to properties. In theory, this will reduce some of the cross subsidies that have plagued the program. CDBGDR is supposed to supplement existing disaster-related authorities. Specifically, these funds are for long-term recovery, including restoration of infrastructure and housing and economic revitalization, but also future disaster mitigation activities. Since 1992, nearly $90 billion have been appropriated to the program. While there is some program direction, in reality, there's a great deal of leeway granted to HUD and the implementing states and communities. Flexibility is an important part of the program, but stability and predictability are also critical to successfully meeting program goals. TCS supports the committee's efforts to statutorily authorize the CDBG program. Climate change, its impacts, NFIP and CDBGDR are critical issues, not just for their budget and taxpayer impacts, but for society as a whole. Federal policies must promote better, uh, most promote realistic and responsible solutions to climate change, including targeting investments that lift innovative solutions and reflect the needs and experience of income and minority communities. The goal must be to develop risk management and mitigation strategies to enable communities, infrastructure, and industries to become more resilient face less risk and can better adapt and to future mitigation costs and climate damages of climate change. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Ellis, for your testimony. Uh, the chair now recognizes the full committee chair, um, Ms. Maxine Waters of California. We are? Yeah. Thank you very much, Chairman Cleaver, for convening this hearing on the need to improve the resiliency of our country's housing infrastructure in the face of climate change. In recent years, the United States has experienced more frequent and intense natural disasters attributable to climate change, displacing tens of thousands of people and costing hundreds of billions of dollars in damage. I've been working across Congresses now with members on both sides of the aisle to reform the National Flood Insurance Program. And I'm looking forward to passing further reforms as well as making a significant investment in our nation's affordable housing stock by passing the Housing is Infrastructure Act as part of President Biden's American Jobs Plan. So I wanna thank you so very much for the attention you're giving to this issue. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we will begin now with uh, questions, and um, uh, I will kick off the, the, the questioning. Uh, Mr. Ellis, you have served in, uh, in a number of offices uh, uh, throughout your uh, career uh, in Austin, the capital, and in Houston, and, and uh, in Harris County. Uh, will you? Give me your uh, opinion of the response to those disasters that you have witnessed uh, of FEMA and HUD. And do you think at the, that there are times in which their requirements and regulations uh, collide? Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. The, the biggest challenge that, that I have seen has been um, obviously HUD money is tied to LMI low to moderate income households. Uh, but most other federal money that we get related to disasters has a cost benefit ratio in it. So on our level, even after Harvey, when we passed a record bond issue, so we try to address some of our own problems, we leverage it with money from you all on the federal level. And when we go to FEMA, when we go to Corps of Engineers, they are generally following a cost benefit ratio analysis. I can understand why one would say we ought to protect, in the case of Houston, our port, our medical center, our downtown. But even my rural communities and counties I talk to around the country, that cost-benefit ratio language is such a big problem. So that means in Houston, 
we spend all our time chasing federal dollars, most of it for mitigation has a cost benefit ratio language in it. So even when you give us money through HUD to rebuild these communities, they are the ones that flood first. There's some rules uh, that have come through our general land office, this uh, limiting the size of bedrooms. So in a neighborhood I grew up in, it was a two bedroom home, five people in it, one bathroom, they expanded it over time. If that house had flooded under GLO's rules, they would say if there are only two people left in the house, you can't go back and do a three bedroom home. You can only do a two bedroom home. So some low income households decide I'll live with the mold. So in the case of my parents, because of discrimination, they had to move into a poor black neighborhood to get federal guarantee. So the only wealth that my 99 year old father had to pass on to, in my case, my sister, was his home. Uh, and uh, that's a real challenge. We appealed it to HUD, previous HUD administration denied it. The city of Houston decided to take local funds to make up for that extra bedroom for many of those low income communities. But that's a big problem. So we're hoping with you all's help and maybe with the new leadership at HUD, we can, we can get that changed. But cost benefit ratio, I can't stress it enough, is the biggest challenge I've seen. So, uh, excuse my interruption, uh, but uh, uh, Commissioner, uh, I, I called you Senator, but uh, 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 Senator, Senator Commissioner, um, I, I, can you, I mean, why did her deny? I mean, what, what was the, the rationale that, that they gave you? Yeah. The best analysis that, that I can come up with is they were thinking if you have a limited amount of money, you could spread it out to more households. When we talked to them, that was that rationale. So we said, we will take other federal money to make up for it. I know those low income communities. Mr. Chairman, you know some of them haven't gone to Purdue. And I also, like my dad's, if he flooded, he would just live with the mold instead of give up that extra bedroom and bathroom because that's his only wealth to pass on. So it, it, it's been a big problem. And HUD told me they hadn't seen that anywhere else in the country. They've not required it. Uh, I, I just think that the land office was trying to be protective, but sometimes we in government uh, want to offer more help than people are willing to take it. Hey, don't worry about the title. Just call me Rodney. That's what they put on the ballot. That's what I've learned. <laughs> Thank you for being with us, uh, uh, Senator Rodney. Uh, uh, the gentleman, Mr. Stivers, uh, the ranking member from Ohio, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, I'd like to request unanimous consent to enter into the record three uh, statements, one from the Manufactured Housing Institute, one from uh, the National Association of Mutual Insurance Companies, and one from the reinsurers. Without objection. Thank you. Um, and my first question is about mitigation and uh, you know i i think we'll be in a much better position going forward if we can do something about mitigation um so i i want to ask um, uh, mr ellis if um you can go into a little depth you talked a little bit about uh mitigation but it seems to me that there's little incentive uh for mitigation efforts because the federal share of these disasters has gone up uh, back in 1955 during Hurricane Diane. The federal government only covered about 6% of the disaster total cost. As part of Superstorm Sandy, the federal government's exposure was 77%. So it seems like there's little incentive to enact mitigation. What can we do to uh, focus on mitigation so that we can reduce the exposure before these disasters? Strike, Mr. Ellis. I'm, su I'm assuming that's that's me. Um, this is Mr. Ellis. Um, so yeah, that's you. Yep. Uh, all right, all right. Just making sure. <laughs> so um, you're absolutely right, uh, Congressman. That they uh, the the share of dis federal share of disasters has grown dramatically, and it's even more recent than than you mentioned, Diane. Um, as recently as Hurricane Hugo in 1989, less than 30% of the total cost was borne by the federal government. So it is, it is skyrocketed in the recent decades. 
And certainly part of it is, 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 is having the enticement of pricing. And we get into this about flood insurance, particularly and about artificially lowering rates. It, it, it's a, it serves as a disincentive to mitigation. And we recognize that, you know, even if you have a lower rate, the flood doesn't, doesn't think you're in a different floodplain. It, it floods you just like the, what your real rate would be. And so essentially you want to make sure that people have incentives to mitigate and that there are opportunities and, and instruction for mitigation as well. Um, and so those are those are really critical elements. But if you flood with cash, then you 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 need to make sure you're directing that cash in the appropriate ways. Thank you. And one follow up question, uh, Mr. Ellis, the uh, the National Flood Insurance Program statute requires that FEMA set premiums based on the risks involved. But the National Flood Insurance Program still uses the same rating methods they've used for the last 50 years. I know that FEMA is doing something to address this. Um, and I, you know, I'm curious what kind of technology should they use, whether it's 3D mapping or other things as they address the real risks involved to charge actuarially sound premiums? Uh, thank you, Congressman Sivers. Yes, that is true that FEMA is using basically the same methodology that they've always used on NFIP. But they are doing, as I mentioned in my testimony, risk rating 2.0, trying to take in increased data. I think that everybody on the panel and in the in the committee can agree that the mapping needs to 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 address um, needs to be better. It needs to use better technologies and more up to date technologies. And then we need to communicate that risk to people because right now there's a many cases where people don't really even recognize the level of risk that they face. And so you want to make that's one tool of risk communication. And we've seen states like North Carolina, for instance, that has have gone leaps and bounds beyond what FEMA has been able to do to provide that information to uh, homeowners where they can understand not just their, their relative risk, but their future risk from even storm events as they're occurring. And one follow up question. Uh, one of the biggest problems in the National Flood Insurance Program is the multiple claim properties. How should we deal with properties that have had three or four claims, uh, what should we do to uh, move forward? Because that appears to be one of the biggest problems in the in the system. It, it, I mean, it's interesting to me, Congressman, that, that they seem to keep up, come up with different terms. There's repetitive loss properties, then severe repetitive loss properties, extremes repetitive loss properties. Clearly, this is an issue that has to be dealt with. And in some cases, you know, um, uh, Congressman Blumenauer back in 2004 was mentioned the uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, reauthorization at that time, he had three floods and you're out of the uh, taxpayer's pocket, three strikes and you're out of the taxpayer's pocket act. And it was basically trying to put more pressure on, on uh, property owners to mitigate or to, to basically to communities to do um, uh, buyouts and, and, and relocation in a structured and thoughtful manner. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, maybe we'll do a second round. I've got lots more questions, but uh, thanks for the time. I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Stivers. Uh, the chair now recognizes Chairwoman Waters for five minutes. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I do appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to direct my question to my old, longtime friend, Commissioner Ellis, uh, politician par excellence. <laughs> thank you for being here today. Uh, I heard what you um, voiced your concern about, and that sounds as if it's just um, you know, bureaucracy with a lack of understanding about how to treat, uh, you know, the support that they give to families uh, and their homes following a hurricane or a disaster. And that's kind of bureaucracy at its worst. Uh, but I want to ask you a little bit about what I experienced when I, uh, after Hurricane Katrina, I worked to hold St. Bernard Parish accountable and ensure federal housing funds would not be used to enact a discriminatory policy that prohibited the construction of multifamily housing uh, post Karina, Katrina. Policies such as blood relative ordinance, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, that prevented St. Bernard Parish homeowners from renting to anyone who was not a blood relative. In the aftermath of the various disasters and weather events in Texas, how has Harris County worked to prevent a desperate impact on communities of color that are seeking to rebuild and recover from natural disasters? Yours didn't sound like 
necessarily discrimination. It just sounded as if it was uninformed, uh, ill-informed uh, individuals that handle uh, the policy following a disaster. Have you seen any signs of direct discrimination? Chair, Chair, I want to thank you for the question and your years of leadership. I went to Xavier, New Orleans, so I'm, I'm well familiar with some of those schemes that were going on in, in Louisiana. In Texas, at the end of the day, that smaller bedroom policy has had a disparate impact on communities of color. Uh, I don't think the intent uh, had anything to do with uh, someone being black or brown, but the effect has because it's been those neighborhoods that have done it the most. I would encourage uh, you all in Congress to make sure you give us the oversight, ask the hard questions. Uh, I, I think HUD, they did, they sent all kinds of smoke signals to the state saying, ditch that idea. But they didn't want to step in and make them do it. Just the, the, the respect, I guess, for local control, which I'm for, other than I'm all for states' rights until the states wrong. <laughs> I have a problem with it. Uh, but it would be well worth looking into, into, into what we do and, and Congresswoman, so much of what we do on the mitigation front, despite all of the great money that comes from HUD, most of the money in our region for mitigation to rebuild, to protect the housing investment has come through FEMA, uh, the Corps of Engineers. And we all spend our time with our money chasing other federal dollars where that cost-benefit ratio comes in. How we get rid of it, my colleagues up from the county level, all sides of the aisle tell me we ought to ditch it. Protect your, your downtown, your airport, but that the risk recognizing more value over somebody's wealthy home, the house I live in now, instead of the house I came out of, I just despise my Well, thank you so much. Uh, I I'm very pleased that uh, Mr. Cleaver, Congressman Cleaver, is taking such a leadership uh, on these kinds of issues. I will do everything that I can to support him, and we really want to do it right. And this is a moment in history where we have an opportunity to do it right. So thank you so very much for being here today. And Chairman Cleaver, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the gentleman, Mr. Posey from Florida, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Ellis, can you please tell us uh, what your research shows about the role of building codes in achieving flood and storm resilience and how these measures are being adopted, the best way they're being adopted uh, by various states? Sure. Thank you very much, Congressman. Um, so uh, building codes are, are, are critical to uh, to basically to resilience and to having resilient housing. And uh, it's something that while it is a state issue and it's something that needs to be determined at the at the state level, um, we can use strings um, from the federal government as far as encouraging stronger building codes, encouraging better building back after disaster. And so, you know, nobody has to take the federal dollars if they don't want to. But that's critical because taxpayers are investing in in, this, in these areas. And so you want to make sure that those investments are are protected and that all those people are protected. We're not doing anybody any favors if we're if, if we're subsidizing construction that isn't actually going to be uh, protective when inevitable disaster strikes come. Okay. Um, also, Mr. Edwards, our, our federal response to flooding is scattered over several agencies, the Corps, FEMA, NRCS, and during disasters, even HUD. Uh, do you believe we could benefit uh, from a cross-cut flood mitigation budget that allows Congress to see how the different agencies contribute to flood solutions and pick the best responses and pair back on the less effective programs? Well, Congressman Posey, I'm all about more budget data being available and, and being able to understand how you know, four trillion dollars is being spent. You know, across the whole federal budget. So certainly in this area where it's very critical, and we throw a lot of money post disaster, it is really important to understand how those funds are being allocated. And we do have different stages in disaster response. You know, I have the disaster relief fund that kicks in right after a disaster. You have the core once they get that they have they have additional funds right immediately, and then they often get more funding and supplementals, and then similarly to HUD. And so understanding how that money is being allocated. One, it increases confidence of the taxpayers that their money is being spent wisely. And that's critical because we're, we're appropriating such huge sums. And so I think something like that would be a, a tremendous asset to Congressman Posey. 
Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Ellis, uh, flood hazard mitigation projects hold the promise of preventing flood damages. And so adapting properties to reduce flood damages, uh, building flood control projects, and even moving people out of harm's way can all help. Uh, please tell us how Harris County approaches the flood mitigation and share with us uh, how we could encourage uh, others to maybe do the same thing. Uh, thank you, uh, Congressman. We've done two things in Harris County that uh, I think the, the rest of the nation should look at. One, with the money we put up, we did come up with equity guidelines on how, we, how we're going to spend the money. It's challenging to follow them because we can't <laughs> attract as much federal match as we'd like to. The other thing we did was uh, we probably passed the strictest building standards in the country. Now, my county engineer says they're the strictest, but I was in Florida at a conference and a colleague challenged me on that. We call it Atlas 14, but you got to build them higher. You know, now that we know, you know, a 500 year flood, I, I'm, I'm, I'm 67 and I, I've lived through three 500 year floods <laughs> in the last 10 years, but it does drive up the cost of construction, but it was the right thing to do. And then yeah. we tied funding to partners, other cities, surrounding counties to adopting the same building standards. And so far, most of them have done that with strong bipartisan support. Smart. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mace, you represent our uh, state insurance commissioners. Can you assess uh, for us how an enlarged role for private flood insurance regulated by the states could improve our nation's flood insurance and how we should resolve the repetitive loss uh, properties in moving to an enlarged private flood insurance presence compared to the NFIP? <laughs> Thank you, Congressman. Appreciate the opportunity to discuss this. And by the way, if I could also say that mitigation, just to throw my two cents in here, is something that we as state insurance regulators were very concerned with, that we're very supportive of. And it's like my father used to tell me, uh, you got to fix a roof before it starts raining. But we do think there is a huge, a significant role for uh, private flood insurance. And we do look at the NAIC, we have been collecting data and the role of private flood insurance has been increasing. We do look forward to working with Congress to enable an even greater role for private flood insurance. And one way to do that, for instance, is with the NFIP. If you enable people to leave without losing their subsidies, you know, so they can test the market, or if they're able to get, as I think as proposed, on bill, get a refund for the time that they left the uh, NFIP. All of this will help and improve the attractiveness of private flood insurance and I think overall reduce the cost of insurance. Well, thank you so much. My time has expired and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The, the gentlewoman uh, from New York, Ms. Velasquez, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for this uh, timing uh, meeting. Uh, Ms. Godreau, I would like to address my first question to you. Puerto Rico's uh, CDBGDR action plan has an across the board prohibition on rebuilding in flood zones. What type of problem does this present to LMI communities? What alternatives are there and what would be a sensible relocation plan look like? Uh, thank you, Congresswoman Velasquez, for the chance to answer this question. Uh, different from other jurisdictions, Puerto Rico is an island. So the impact of climate change, sea level rise, has a very direct impact on the people living, particularly in flood zones, in coastal zones. Uh, these communities, for uh, several historic reasons, going back to slavery, are low-income and Black communities, which are deeply affected by across-the-board prohibitions. Uh, we're talking about 250,000 homes that are in flood zones in Puerto Rico. Relocation is not possible within the, geogra the geography of Puerto Rico if we don't have a sensible relocation policy that, for example, includes an inventory of the available housing that includes uh, or that um, eliminates the discrimination against people with formal titles, which is almost half of the population, and that also accounts for climate migration, not only in the short term, but also in the long run uh, of the island. Thank you. And Ms. Gautreau, as you mentioned in your testimony and your uh, uh, previous answer, 69% of the inhabitants of Puerto Rico are homeowners, yet many lack formal titleship, which makes it more difficult for them to access FEMA aid. How was your organization able to help 
homeowners overcome their lack of formal title? Uh, FEMA denied approximately 77,000 applications of families in Puerto Rico. So uh, neglected assistance uh, snowballs and grows exponentially. What we're seeing right now is that constant discrimination against, against people with formal title once again like hinders the rights of black low-income communities who because of access to justice, because of cultural patterns, and because the, the process is very complex and slow, are not able uh, to access assistance. As I said in my... Let, let, let me ask you, what other steps can FEMA and HUD take to help make it easier for homeowners without formal titles to have their claims uh, recognized? Uh, FEMA regulations already state a definition of owners that doesn't that doesn't require registry or, or a title deed. We need HUD and CDBGDR programs to adopt this kind of, of definition. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Mays, since 2017, we have reauthorized the National Flood Insurance Program a total of 16 times on a short-term basis. I have called for reauthorizing the program for as long as 10 years. As you know, uh, the program is once again set, uh, set to expire at the end of September. Can you explain why a long-term reauthorization of the NFIP on a bipartisan basis is so important. Thank you, Congresswoman. And let me just say here, I'm gonna go back to the idea of mitigation planning, because what this does is it enables people, this is what insurance is all about. We are going to pay some now so that we are, we can be sure if something happens, we're covered. So that's the way we as insurance regulators look at various insurance programs, including the NFIP. The NFIP, as you mentioned, has had a number of significant or a number of short-term that uh, reauthorizations. Well, I'm a homeowner, and I actually am a homeowner with a with an NFIP policy. It makes it difficult to plan. You know, you just don't know what's going to happen, how long this is going to be in place, and where you should go after this. So that reliance on short-term authorizations or reauthorizations, I think, has created a tremendous amount of uncertainty for consumers, and that includes businesses that rely on flood insurance. And we, you also have to, or at least certainly, we keep in mind the fact I've uh, been in this business for a while. People don't understand that flood insurance policies take effect after 30 days. It's hard okay. enough convincing people to get the policies. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, the, the gentlewoman yields back. Uh, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Stiles, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Chairman. I uh, appreciate uh, you holding today's hearing. I, I got to say, though, I look forward uh, to the majority allowing us uh, to be back in person across the board in D.C. We're spending money uh, like drunken sailors pretty darn inefficiently. Uh, we can't even do it in person. And so I hope the majority brings us back. I'm excited to talk about uh, today's topic as well, albeit uh, virtually. So let's let's dive in with the, the short amount of time. There's been a lot of discussion uh, surrounding the National Flood uh, Insurance Program reauthorization and how are we going to really ultimately uh, keep rates in check. I'm, I'm sympathetic uh, to homeowners uh, who are concerned about their ability to uh, to bear higher rates. Uh, and really, to me, that's why it's important uh, when we're looking at how we do this, uh, that we're talking about lowering risk. We heard uh, Mr. Mays talk about uh, his support of mitigation funding, uh, possibly private flood insurance. Uh, I've seen some of uh, some people's write-ups here in their formal testimony uh, support that as well, which which brings me to a pretty significant concern uh, in the, uh, the draft of the NFIP uh, reauthorization that's attached to today's hearing is I read this uh, it puts in place a 9% uh, increase cap. And is, is in my reading of this, uh, that applies to all property, including uh, second homes and severe uh, repetitive loss. And so my concern uh, is that someone in Janesville, Wisconsin is going to be on the hook uh, to subsidize uh, somebody's second home uh, on the ocean uh, or uh, some fancy pants uh, vacation home. And we're putting taxpayers in Kenosha or Janesville uh, or Racine on the hook for this. That's one. Uh, and then two, when you set a flat cap of 9%, one of my concerns is, is, is that we're going to discourage uh, homeowners from taking steps uh, to mitigate themselves from high-risk properties uh, in particular. And so, Steve Ellis, 
uh, if I can address a question to you in particular as it relates to a 9% cap uh, for fancy pants, second, second homes uh, on the ocean, uh, not talking about people who are struggling to get by, we're talking about people who are buying second properties. Uh, do you think that there's a moral hazard being created by this uh, draft legislation as currently written? Absolutely, Congressman. I mean, I think that's one of the issues that was um, it, true in flood insurance. Regardless, there's some moral hazard issues and not pricing risk appropriately and having subsidies uh, that are already in the program. And I talked about in both my written testimony and uh, here about tremendous cross subsidies that exist where you have people in, I can't say specifically in Janesville or Racine, but they are these are um, counties with lower property values and lower deciles. The five, the, actually the five bottom deciles are actually subsidizing properties in the top two deciles. And that's documented by the Government Accountability Office. And having a 9% cap, which halves it from what the cap was under the previous le legislation, which was 18%, is going to discourage some of the mitigation activities, is also going to stifle the private market, which it would be better for taxpayers to move off some of this risk off of the taxpayers and into the private sector, who is eager to take on that risk in many cases. Yeah, we got some beautiful property uh, in the state of Wisconsin. I encourage you to come on up uh, to our state, but I can tell you it's not the pricey property that you're going to get in oceanfront uh, second homes uh, in, uh, in California along the coast, uh, just from a cost standpoint. So I'm concerned about uh, putting Wisconsin taxpayers on the hook for these second homes uh, along the coast um, for, for people that uh, should otherwise uh, be able to, uh, to bear that burden on their second property. Shift gears slightly. We're talking about the moral hazard, if we can, Mr. Ellis. Uh, if we go back and just kind of look at over history, we're seeing a significant shift of this risk to the federal government. Uh, in my research, uh, Hurricane Diane, 1955, federal government uh, came in with about 6% of the total cost. Uh, you get up to Katrina, you get to 50%. 2008, uh, federal government gets up to 69%. Uh, Superstorm Sandy, 2012, we're up to 77%. We can see where the trend line's going here. What do you, can you share a little bit of your view here as to the moral hazards we're putting all this burden on the federal government, what that does uh, from a mitigation standpoint at the, uh, at the individual, at the local and at the state level? Everybody's got to have skin in the game, Congressman. And uh, if you don't have that, then you are, it, it is a disincentive to actually um, do the mitigation, to do the, the, the hard work. And we certainly want to see states and communities prepare for these inevitable disasters. We know they're going to occur. And so that we should have a sliding scale of disaster assistance, in our opinion, and then also have uh, strings that are trying to encourage states and localities to have their plans in place and be ready to go right after the disaster ends. I, I appreciate your feedback, uh, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate having this hearing. Look forward uh, for all of us to be hopefully uh, in person discussing these important topics in the near future. And with that, I will yield back. Thank you, Mr. Stiles. <clears throat> the gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I guess I'm here just to epitomize beachfront property in California. Um, I uh, think Mr. Stiles has a point that uh, the federal government is observing more and more of the cost of uh, natural disasters. Uh, but if he thinks that's going to change, I I've been here a long time. I've never seen more than a handful of members vote against a disaster relief bill. I've seen some of the most conservative, wouldn't pay a penny for anything libertarians, vote for disaster bills. And so it is in our interest to make sure that uninsured losses are kept at a minimum because whatever uninsured losses there are, if it happens to just one or two people, they're going to absorb the cost. But if it's a national disaster, it's in the headlines. Uh, I don't even think uh, the gentleman from Wisconsin is going to walk to the floor and vote against the next disaster relief bill. Um, we've given local control on all of the most important issues affecting housing. We now have a circumstance where in my city, it seems to cost about $700,000 to build an apartment unit. Um, we have building standards where if the building isn't uh, uh, resilient, it's as Mr. Stahl points out, uh, well, gonna be the federal government bearing the cost. And then finally, in one area that I think is significant enough that we should override local control and that is the need to have recharging stations available 
particularly to those who live in apartment buildings. We can't get people to buy electric cars if they can't recharge them at home. And home for everybody is not a single family house with a three car garage. For an awful lot of Americans, it's a carport uh, where the landlord hasn't put in an electric charging station. So at least if every apartment building and every paid for parking structure at work uh, had recharging, we might get to uh, the president's objective of, uh, of electric cars. Um, uh, I got a question for uh, Mr. Emmaus. Uh, most flood insurance policies are, of course, underwritten by the NFIP. There are more than 5 million property holders nationwide. Um, and the NIFP is the nation's largest single line insurance, nearly 1.3 trillion coverage. Unless reauthorized by Congress by September 30th of this, this year, the authority to provide new flood insurance will expire. And if NFIB uh, authority to borrow from the treasury will be cut from 30 billion to 1 billion. Over 20,000 communities across the country participate in the NFIP and over 5 million policy uh, holders rely on it. Can you explain what happens to those communities and families uh, who, who would no longer have access to the National Flood Insurance Program? Uh, and how would this lapse uh, um, uh, affect the communities uh, in which they live? Thank you, Congressman. It's difficult for me to project what will happen across the nation. We can tell you what we've heard over the past few years as the NFIP has been up or been close to not being reauthorized. And we go back to that issue of uncertainty. People do need the certainty that they will have the insurance coverage to protect what will be, in many cases, their single most important asset. This is what they're going to be passing down to their children. And there is, you know, there is, there's no doubt that there is a growing private market uh, over the past, uh, I think we, in 2019, for instance, we had 526 million in direct written premium in the private market, which is up. 100 million from the year before and the earned premium was less than that which means the market's growing <laughs> that's just the taking stuff but what that tells us compared to the fact that the nfip had approximately at its current rates uh almost three and a half billion dollars earned premium in 2018 is that it does represent a significant portion of the market and that is why we're asking for that long-term reauthorization. Thank, thank you the final comment i want to make is you can argue for this kind of flood insurance program or that kind of flood insurance program, but what you can't argue is doing it before the last minute is better for the country. We don't want to take people into July and August not knowing what their situation is, especially if they're trying to sell their home, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the gentleman, uh, Mr. Taylor from Texas, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and I'll echo my colleague uh, from Wisconsin's first district. I, I wish we were in person, particularly because I get the chance to to greet in person uh, my good friend and, and colleague from the Texas Senate, Commissioner Ellis. It's great to see you uh, here with us today. Uh, appreciate your insights uh, and your expertise. Uh, I wanted to go into uh, something that I learned about the state legislators. They called actuarial soundness. Right. So uh, if you're gonna if you charge less than what you need to make a product, eventually you go out of business unless the government kicks in some money. Uh, and so I think I think I heard the number ninety billion dollars. Uh, let's see. So who said that? That would be. Um, let's see. That would be that would be the Republican expert. Can you speak to the not, how much over what period of time has the federal government kicked in ninety billion dollars into the flood program? Sure, Congressman Taylor. Uh, the uh, the ninety billion dollars is the Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery um, uh, Program, and so that kicked in after Andrew and um, and a couple other storms, uh, Omar and Iniki, in nineteen ninety two. So basically, from ninety three forward has been that ninety billion dollars. So, are we charging an actuarially sound uh, flood insurance premium at the present time? It, no, sir. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the flood insurance program 
is created to have built-in subsidies. If your, if your structure was built before the flood insurance rate map or before the program was created, then you have a subsidized rate. If the zones change, so like you basically because of climate change or whatever or development nearby, you shift from being a lower risk zone to a higher risk zone, you get to keep your rate. Um, the fact that the program can borrow um, from the federal government also is a, is a significant subsidy, particularly considering that it's underwater, it's borrowed almost $40 billion from the taxpayer to date. So it is not an actuarially sound program. I could, you could argue that that was not the intent initially, um, but we should be, we're in a different place than we were in 1968. Um, we have much better uh, technology and soundness and we need to be developing and improving the program. So it's not as much of a burden on taxpayers. So, and I, I guess that's what I would ultimately drive toward trying to create an actuarially sound program that stands on its own. Uh, and that's in the interest uh, of the taxpayers. It's also in the interest of the ratepayers. Uh, um, when you set up an actuarially unsound program, eventually the taxpayers get tired of paying for that and they end up ditching the ratepayers on the side of the road. And so I just, and I don't want to see that happen. I want to see, the, you know, I want to see a program that is functional. Uh, but I think mathematically we set it up to be non-functional, uh, and I think that that takes that's going to take some work uh, to to really work through that. Um, and um, this little bear, I just on Puerto Rico. Uh, when I hear about people owning uh, ti uh, title to properties without clear title, uh, my heart goes out to those people. I mean, that's that's a that's a really tough spot to be in. And as a former state legislator, I kind of think, gee, like that's something that the Puerto Rico legislature should fix. I mean, do you really want, do, I mean, do you need a congressman from Texas to go and fix this for you? I mean, I, I would hope that you guys are working on that in Puerto Rico and you can ultimately solve this problem. Um, hopefully, in, uh, in fact, we used the example from Texas to develop the sworn statement and to make the lobbying process for the CDBER alternative title declaration. What we need is like basic clear guidelines stating and mandating local governments not to require formal titles. Um, as I said, it's basically a waste of disaster aid funds to be using this money to try to push title clearance processes that may last for years and have no results. And I guess my concern is that if the federal government makes it easier for people without clear title to get access, then then it disincentivizes your legislature from fixing this problem, which is really and it's obviously bigger than this, right? I mean, like like this is one piece of a much bigger problem because there's the transfer issue, there 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 are property and casualty insurance issues, there are lending issues. I mean, I mean, not having clear title. Th this is a very small piece. Fortunately, I mean, it's obviously enormous for the people to have this problem. Uh, and I don't, I don't want, I'm not in any way I said that very sympathetic to this particular problem, but I just, I worry that if we, if we fix this particular piece of it, oh, okay, we don't have to worry about it. Uh, when really, I, I think it's incumbent on the, on the, the legislature in Puerto Rico to actually go ahead and fix this. And I know, and I appreciate that you followed Texas as an example. Mr. Ellis, great to see you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Ohio, Ms. Beatty, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm glad to be here and glad to see everyone on Zoom. And like my uh, colleague, Congressman Style, and I believe Congressman Taylor, I too would like for us all to be in the room. So uh, maybe if everyone gets vaccinated, uh, that would be helpful for our leadership to move us uh, back into that. Uh, I'm a big proponent of the vaccination uh, for a whole lot of reasons, uh, mostly based on data and statistics. But with that said, uh, let me thank all of our witnesses for being here today and providing their testimony. Uh, my first question is for you, Commissioner uh, Ellis, and uh, thank you. Uh, for being here uh, and seeing you again. I uh, saw you in our last Congress as you be came before our Oversight and Investigation Committee. So we have heard about some of the devastations that have happened uh, across the country. And we know over the last years, we've uh, seen uh, record-breaking floods and fires and, and hurricanes. Uh, of untold suffering. And we know that uh, affects the least of us the most. We know that there's a national shortage already of an estimated 7 
million affordable renting homes for extremely low income renters across this country. And so the lack of affordable housing disproportionately affects communities of color. The shortage is greatly exacerbated when we have any one of these natural disasters. For example, after the devastation brought to Hurricane Katrina, the housing authorities of New Orleans reported having close to some 2,000 public housing units for low income, and that was 3,000 less than what they had expected prior to the hurricane. So that's why I strongly support Congressman Green's priority for one-for-one -for -one replacement of affordable housing units in his CDBG DR proposal. So Commissioner Ellis, can you briefly describe for us any issues that Harris County has had with replacing affordable housing units after Hurricane Harvey? Thank you, Congresswoman, and, and good to see you again. Uh, we've had tremendous problems. Uh, Congressman uh, Taylor and I were in the legislature and together in Texas, and Texas even has a, a rule for low-income housing credits that uh, when Congressman Taylor and I were there, your state senator, your state a house member had to sign off and you get credits towards getting low-income housing credits if they sign the letter. And on the Senate side, with Representative uh, Congressman Taylor's support, we got rid of that. But on the House side, we couldn't. And it's a big problem because of the NIMBY issue. In fact, since I'm no longer in the state legislature, I can admit sometimes I would write a letter opposing low-income housing credits and then call the department head and say, you don't have to put your name on the ballot. Put it in. Uh, and then when they put that in the law, you couldn't stop that. But it's a big problem uh, because of that issue and the fact that most of us around the country rely on the federal government or incentives by virtue of the federal government to do affordable housing. You know, George Floyd is from the CUNY homes right across from Congressman Green's alma mater in my Texas Southern University. It initially was not built for blacks. It was for whites only. It's the oldest housing project in Houston. And we got to face issues on what we do there. You can't even have central air in it because it's just so old. But then the challenge is that plenty of developers want to take it down. You know, my mentor, Congressman Leland, uh, put in federal legislation with back then Congressman Frost out of Dallas, Congressman Taylor, to block uh, developers from taking over affordable housing near downtown. But it's always a challenge because of the NIMBY issue. I, I hope that in addition to the legislation you made reference to that uh, Congressman Green and the chairwoman of Waters, obviously, and, and, and you, Mr. Chairman, as well, have advocated, you ought to put some incentives in there to get us to help on the local level. When I was on city council, uh, we put up some money, about $20 million every five years in our capital improvement program. I'm hoping my county does that as well. As one of your colleagues made reference earlier, you know, we, we, it's all their money, uh, but it's not fair for us to always put it on you. We ought to take some of that, that heat for four miles. And, and I'm going to stop you because I think my clock is running down, and I want to ask uh, our witness, Ms. Potashe, can you briefly explain the economic effects of a national disaster on low income communities as opposed to a beach town field? And this is with second. Can I continue to answer? Or yes, yes, why don't you proceed, uh, Ms. Potashe, with the answer? Okay, great. Um, so you know, the, the economic implications of disasters on low-income households are profound. Most low-income households actually live in rental housing, so they're at the whim of the apartment building owner or the owner of the home to retrofit these units. And um, we really do need to get much more proactive in the way that we think about addressing climate change and the impacts on low-income households. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, you have uh, absolutely hit a home run with this hearing. I am uh, also very grateful to Ms. Wagner because uh, she and I have worked together on the CDBDR uh, disaster relief bill. 
And uh, the CDGBDR bill is something that we hope to get passed again. We passed it in the House in the last session. And thank you, Ms. Beatty, for your very kind words. Uh, I always appreciate being in hearings with you and you spoke quite well. Uh, I, I can compliment you for your many, um, your many ways that you get things done. Thank you. Now, let me talk quickly about a couple of things. Uh, the first is uh, I have a commissioner in Fort Bend County who has called something to my attention. And he has indicated to me that in Fort Bend County, they have levies. These are FEMA certified levies, Mr. Chairman. And he indicates that these levies protect from flooding. And it is his position, and I tend to agree with him, that if these levies are protecting from flooding and they are certified by FEMA, he believes that the cost for the uh, flood insurance should be reduced because the risk is being reduced by the levies. And the cost should be directly proportional to the risk. If the risk goes down, then the cost should go down. So I'm going to ask um, Ms. Pocher, uh, would you please uh, give some comment on this? Well, I think that, that these are very good questions, uh, Congressman, and um, we should be modulating the cost or the, or the, uh, the cost and the, and the insurance coverage based on actual risk. I think often we have really underestimated the risk. Um, we hear now all the time about 100 year flood zones and we're having floods in those areas every five, eight years. So we have got to not only uh, update our information and make sure that it actually takes into account the risk of much more extreme and more frequent storms, but we also need to understand that the old ways that we've been looking at this are just not working anymore. So even in an area that might be protected by a levy, uh, we've seen those levies fail. So we should be really um, importantly focused on um, the actual risk to communities and the others are, um, are protected. Thank you very much. Let me do this, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to offer for the record a document, a communique from this commissioner, Commissioner Ken Merchant. He has some additional uh, 12, 13 points that uh, I think would be worthy of our consideration. So I'd like to place this in the record. And I'd like to continue with another issue, understanding that uh, there'll be more that we will do and talk about as it relates to the issue that he's called to our attention. Uh, right now, uh, uh, Commissioner Ellis, uh, you have had some concerns with reference to the CDBGDR funds getting to you. HUD has recommended uh, that we change this system. The HUD OIG has indicated that we codify the process so that we don't reinvent the wheel every time there is a disaster. And I'd like to get your response in terms of how codification could be of great benefit to the recipients of the funds, if you would. Congressman, thank you. I think it would be helpful as long as there's appropriate a congressional oversight of what we do. Uh, and making sure that any guidelines that are codified, uh, equity is replete as part of the process. And equity has to be more than just a six letter word. Uh, obviously on my level, we prefer you do a direct allocation to us so we don't have to argue about the administrative costs uh, with our state partners. But the key is guidelines that have equity. And, and I'll close with, you know, when HUD was created, LBJ wanted uh, the direct allocation. Cities and counties wanted the block grant approach, but oftentimes they have not, we have not been as equitable in how we spend the money. That HUD money was directed for the most vulnerable among us. That's why it was created. Uh, just as a quick follow-up, um, also, I, I'm sure you're concerned about the, uh, the timely manner in which the funds are received. Uh, uh, that has been a problem, I think. And I agree with you, direct allocation would work. We are attempting to put together a means by which that can take place. Uh, and I believe that uh, it is doable. We've done it before. Hopefully, we can uh, put this into some sort of codified language and make it permanent. Uh, finally, this, uh, with reference to the, 
Well, with reference to my next opportunity to talk about this, I will yield back my time uh, today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Green. The uh, gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Maloney, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for your testimony. And uh, it's a very important topic. The hearing touches on the intersection of two crises uh, which are being felt acutely in my city, uh, New York, the climate crisis and the affordable housing crisis. Uh, climate change is one of the single most pressing threats facing New Yorkers, this country and the global community. And our most vulnerable communities are bearing the brunt of the consequences. As we look to building back better, we must do so with a focus on climate justice and climate resiliency. For New York City, that means investing in a green future for New York City's public housing. To celebrate Earth Day this year, I gathered with climate activists and NYCHA residents to discuss efforts to invest in climate solutions while also addressing our affordable housing crisis. The Green New Deal for Public Housing introduced by my colleague Ocasio-Cortez would help us achieve this by investing up to $180 billion over 10 years in sustainable retrofits that target okay. urgent maintenance repairs, improvements to residents' health and safety, and the elimination of carbon emissions. It also provides funding to electrify all buildings, add solar panels, and secure renewable energy sources for all public housing energy needs. In short, it will make federal housing cleaner, safer, and greener. Ms. Potica, do you believe that the federal government should include carbon reduction and climate resiliency uh, when we invest in affordable housing? Thank you, Congresswoman. I appreciate the question. And I really appreciate your vision for a more comprehensive set of solutions. Because what we know, the science tells us that even if we go full bore on making our communities as resilient as possible, we are still going to be facing the impacts of climate change. And affordable housing is so essential to be a key role in our response because these are the people who are the most vulnerable. They are the most vulnerable to harm when their home uh, doesn't have uh, tight windows, air comes in, moisture builds, they get asthma, they're sent to the hospital. But they're also more vulnerable due to uh, an inability to have a really stable home. So the more that we can connect climate resilience and affordable housing as one issue, that really, I think, is the, the, the place that we should be. Well, as a follow-up, will the failure to invest in climate resiliency lead to the loss of more housing units contributing to the affordable housing crisis in our nation? Again, well, absolutely. Thank you very much. I mean, I think that um, what we have seen after community is uh, housing that has not been kept up to standards. These are the most vulnerable households to an extreme weather event, a hurricane or a big wind event. And if we start to lose those house housing units, we're starting to really see a catastrophe in our communities. And in your written statement, you mentioned two action items we can take to address equity housing and climate resiliency. One supporting community led development and two funding community ownership. I recently introduced the Affordable Housing Preservation Act with Representative Omar, and the legislation will establish a $200 million grant program run by HUD that would support nonprofits in their efforts to create and preserve affordable housing options by developing cooperatives for low income homeowners. This legislation seems to align with your prescription of supporting community led development and funding community ownership. Can you elaborate on how these two principles are important for addressing climate equity and housing? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, community led development and funding community ownership 
really help ensure that communities can continue to reverse the legacy of uh, disinvestment and segregation from our policies and instead allow people to lead the response in their own way. They want the agency to be able to design their futures. Well, thank you. My time has expired. I yield back. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, for calling this important hearing and all the panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Maloney. Uh, would anyone who uh, may not, um, who may have the, the, the mute button on, please uh, uh, turn it off. Uh, there's some feedback coming in. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Vargas of California, you are now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. First, I want to thank you for holding this hearing. I think it's been an excellent hearing and, and, and very provocative in many ways. I also want to thank, uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't thank uh, General Stivers for his service, both uh, to the military and to the Congress. Uh, you really are an asset uh, and we will miss you deeply. Uh, everyone respects you deeply. Thank you. Um, I also would like to meet in person, you know, and, and uh, I, again, uh, would echo the, 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 the same remarks as Ms. Beatty, get vaccinated. Tell uh, Mr. Taylor, tell your uh, colleagues, please get vaccinated so we can meet in person again. I think it is important and it's also science. And, and since I mentioned science, I mean, it, it is interesting for many years, I've argued the point of climate change with my colleagues uh, on the Republican side. And I would always, unfortunately, get to the, the point where they would make the point about cows flagellating and how that also is climate change. The, well, the reality is it's not. It's ex an existential threat. And, and we have to do something about it. And I think that uh, now we're all taking it seriously. I hope we are. And we're going to do something about it. But something also that came up here that I think we have to take seriously is uh, not building in areas that we know are going to be prone to flooding and also fires. Fires haven't been mentioned. Here in California, we're building more and more in fire prone areas. It does, doesn't make sense. Um, so those are moral hazards when we allow people to do it. Now, I heard the testimony that in Puerto Rico and other places, it's very poor people that are oftentimes in these floodplains, and that's true. But also you have along the coast here in California, as was mentioned, some very expensive homes that should not have been built right along the coast. In fact, oftentimes, when I was on the Coast Commission, I would vote against building the rock walls and all these other things and, and these things that would prevent the houses from falling into the ocean because the reality is that the, the cliffs erode and that's how we get the sand to plenish our beaches. So some of these things are just natural. But I, I do want to ask, I mean, because I think it is an important thing. Why, why do we continue to allow the building in these dangerous places? I think a lot of us, would would agree that you know it's important not to do that I, and, and it's controversial because on both sides there's there's reasons to be against it or in favor uh miss pochica why don't i ask you that why do we allow that or should we uh, <laughs> thank you uh congressman vargas um that's a really great question and it is probably the central conundrum of this issue um we have a tradition in the US of, of local control and letting communities make their own decisions. And yet often the science is telling us that the way that we built in the past is not gonna do us very well going forward. And so we really do need to create incentives to move people out of harm's way and make them more resilient. Uh, and so, I, I applaud your uh, experiences on the California Coastal Commission. I think it's a very challenging issue. And maybe the only real way to do that is through um, creating a carrot that is so sweet and tasty that it promulgates change. Okay, well, uh, Mr. Uh, Commissioner Ellis, I don't know you, but you um, are very well respected obviously by everybody. That's a tough question. How about you? I know that. You know, a lot of places there, I imagine people don't want to move, but they probably should. What should we do? Congressman, I, I think it's a, a lack of political will to do it. And obviously, if we talk about neighborhoods where they have more money, they're more fluent, more political clout, it's even more difficult, you know, separate issue. But, you know, we run highways through neighborhoods and take out poor areas all the time. Yeah. So there ought to be some equity there when we do it. And there ought to be some consequences. The carrot approach does work but at some point you got to have a little bit of a stick 
Uh, and you know what, what, look, by the way, I represent the energy capital of the world. And I know if I want to remain the energy capital, that means we've got to diversify uh, those right. sources of energy. But look, it's a lack of political will and we ought to stop it. It's just wrong. Would anyone else like to comment in my last 35 seconds? Certainly. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Varga. Yes. Uh, in Puerto Rico, we are not asking for people to be living in risk zones. What we are saying is that relocation should never be the first option. Uh, like to clarify the scope of CDBGDR, if you're a person living in a flood zone and you don't have a formal title, circumstances that all uh, that usually come together, you have no options, no incentives, no aid under CDBGDR because of locally imposed guidelines. What we're saying is that mitigation is often unequal. So uh, we are promoting promoting tourism, uh, hotel building, and at the same time, we're saying people, poor people, you can't live there. So we're asking for equitable mitigation and sensible relocation and incentives policy. Well, thank you very much. I know the gentleman's almost out of time. Would the gentleman yield for one second? Uh, I am out of time, but I'd certainly yield to you, General, of course. Well, I, I would just uh, ask, since you're the third member that's brought it up, that uh, the members of the majority go to the uh, chairwoman and ask her to survey to see who's been vaccinated. I don't think there's any members of either side of the aisle on this committee that have not been vaccinated. And maybe we can can meet in person again if the chairwoman would be willing to survey the members to see who's been vaccinated. Uh, I believe the members on our side of the aisle haven't been vaccinated. So after having that come up a couple of times, I figured I'd just put in that plug. It's my last, uh, Will you come back for it, General? So I can say something like that. <laughs> I yield back. <laughs> Thank you, very much. I yield back. I will deliver those uh, comments, uh, uh, Mr. Stivers, to the uh, chairwoman. Uh, the, uh, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Lawson, you're now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for uh, holding this uh, meeting. Uh, my question is going to be to the whole panel uh, for each one of them to uh, comment on it. Uh, in 2018, the Trump administration did not activate FEMA disaster housing assistance program after Hurricane Harvey, Irma, and Maria. The program provided direct rental assistance and case management for low income residents displaced by the disaster. 60% of, of, uh, 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 of, uh, my victim was denied FEMA assistance monthly at the Harvard, just 26% of the people who applied for FEMA. A small business administration assistance had been approved according to a December 2017 survey. Navigating the system can be hard for anyone, but especially for impoverished victims of the storm. Should FEMA disaster housing assistance program be activated? And how can the government improve uh, improve the approval rate for low income residents who have been negatively impacted by by the natural disasters and that is for the whole panel is anyone on the panel want to respond if, if, if i might this is rodney ellis out of houston harris county i think yes it should be activated uh, I think as much as you can do to encourage direct allocations to those local communities so we don't have to fight with our state partners over administrative fees, who should, be, who should, be, who should administer it. And I think it would be wise to call us back in and explain what we do. Give us some deadlines and if we don't meet them, ask us to explain why. Congressman uh, Lawson. Uh... I, just to respond to your question, I'm, I'm not super familiar with the program, but I would say is that, um, you know, when a, an affected governor goes to the president and asks for a major disaster declaration, a major disaster declaration, and it, relieves, it releases the DRF funds, other programs in FEMA should be tapped. I mean, this is something that, that would make sense to me. Um, but then also, I think that um, uh, this is an area where, uh, you know, when you talk about the approval rate and working with people, I mean, these are people in the in the best of times are going to have potentially some difficulty applying for funds and then you put a disaster on top of it 
And it's a much more challenging situation. And so I think that that's also a place where the, the federal government has to step beyond and try to provide assistance to people to apply for these, these funds and work through. And lastly, just one thing that's kind of my separate little ax to grind, and I'll be very brief, is that you, know, you have an aviation disaster and we have a commission that goes and looks at what happened, analyzes it, comes out with a report. We have major disasters, tens of billions of federal dollars, and there's no after action sort of review of this. You know, the, what, what should we learn? What should we apply? How can we make sure that when another, like when after Rita, you had Harvey, what did we learn to make sure that we, we don't have that similar situation and we better responding to disaster the next time around? Uh, Congressman, this is Shelley Potisha from the Natural Resources Defense Council. And yes, we should uh, put forth uh, unlock housing assistance, rental assistance. And let me just put a little bit of uh, data to the question. Um, the impact on wealth inequality in natural disasters is profound. Black households lose an average of $27,000 in wealth after a natural disaster. Hispanic households are, are estimated to lose is $29,000 for households. And at the same time, white households gained $126,000 in wealth. And that really affects renters more than homeowners. So we have got to put people at the center of this response and, in, and center racial equity. Um. I think that open data, it's also like a big part of this process. As one of you already said, uh, knowing and learning about the mistakes from the past could be incredibly useful. In our case, like learning reasons for denial, spaces for denials was extremely hard and we had to present several FOIAs just to realize that um, ownership or like lack of an official address were being reasons. Um, also, we think that in the aftermath of a disaster, requesting people to access an application only using the internet or only using a telephone when there's no light and no telephones, uh, it's also a hindrance, uh, uh, an obstacle. Well, Chairman, I, well, Chairman, I'll give you back, but this is a big issue, especially in Florida, where we have a lot of hurricanes and there's something need to be done about that. And I, I agree with Mr. Ellis. And, uh, and, and everyone who has spoken on this, but this is a big issue that we need to resolve. We do it for everybody else, but we don't do it for people in need, uh, losing all of their income and everything else because of these hurricanes. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Lawson. Uh, the gentlewoman from Iowa, Ms. Axney, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses for being here. I'm, I'm glad we're having this hearing, actually, so that we can better protect people's homes from disasters and climate change, which, of course, my colleague just mentioned in his own district, and we're, um, we're seeing it here, of course, in Iowa. The UN released a report earlier this year finding that natural disasters are occurring at three times more often as they were just 40 years ago. And in the last two years, boy, have I seen homes in my district devastated by major flooding along the Missouri River and by a derecho that brought 140 mile per hour winds here across Iowa and the Midwest. So I tend to look at resiliency in terms of a couple categories, how we build homes and where we build them. So to start with um, how we build them, Ms. Pochicha, can you talk about some of the long term benefits of using modern building codes and methods? Thank you, Congresswoman. I, I appreciate that that uh, question because we do want to to see a as a result of these conversations higher standards in the way that we build our homes and buildings, and that is not only to make sure that say the roof doesn't blow off when a big wind comes through, but it's also to make sure that everyday living is healthier, particularly for low-income households and renters. We know that incidents of asthma are much higher in black and brown low-income communities. When a building doesn't have full enclosure, which actually also reduces energy use and helps us mitigate climate change, 
when we have water infiltration, health incidents are much, much higher. So there's a multiple win when we start to think about improving our building standards. So I thank you for that. And I appreciate you bringing up the health aspect of that. Do you possibly know how much uh, people could save just on energy efficiency improvements? Uh, Congressman, are you saying if they make their home energy efficient, how much do they save? Right, correct. How could how much could the average family be saving if we if we pushed for energy efficiency across this country in individuals' homes and helped with that? Well, thank you for that question. I think it varies across the country, and I can get you much more detailed information. But what we found is that uh, households are saving uh, up to 20% of their um, monthly bills if they weatherize their homes, which is a lot of money. <laughs> That's a lot of money. Um, thank you for that. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that there's a heck of a lot of room for improvement there um, in helping American families reduce their expenses through more energy efficient homes. Um, I'm wondering, Mr. Mays, are those improvements something that does uh, or should be included in insurance rates? Thank you, Congresswoman. And you know, as insurance regulators, we support whatever efforts can be made to incentivize mitigation and to reduce, you know, and to increase resilience, reduce the damage that uh, any catastrophe can cause. And this is something we've been working on. As I mentioned, we've been we were we had a recent. Uh, workshop with IBHS looking, trying to look at cost benefit metrics as we look at what it takes to be able to have resilient housing. It's important, I think, if we look at, forget Congress, I think it's important for Congress to do what it can, incentivize states, help FEMA fully fund its mitigation program. You can't just homeowners, a homeowner like myself, the NAIC did a study, uh, we did a survey last, that was published at the start of uh, April, this is May. And they asked homeowners, just your regular average homeowners across the country, would they be willing to invest their own money to protect against, uh, you know, to, to, to mitigate any damages, to increase resiliency, and perhaps to get a reduction in their insurance costs? And you, if you take a look on it, you will be stunned at how many homeowners want to do that. I think the need is there, the understanding is there. And we as insurance regulators are working with industry and working with academia to see what we can do to ensure that these building codes, A, are best done as strongly as possible to preserve the housing stock, and B, that any savings are recognized by those households that actually take advantage of uh, resiliency measures. Well, thank you. And real quickly, I want to get in here uh, on my colleague Lawson's uh, same kind of thinking there. I've got folks who are still waiting to make sure that they can get their funding and get bought out in this district. Are there ways that you all think we could better serve constituents through FEMA? Well, yeah, why don't you answer? Uh, Mr. Mays, uh, the uh, the time is out. Uh, yeah, what should you yeah. and respond? If that were directed at me, I'm perhaps not the person to answer that as a state insurance regulator. That's a federal issue. It's an issue of federal policy, and I just don't feel it's it's within my purview as a state insurance regulator to respond to that. Any other uh, folks on the panel that would like to respond? This is Rod Neal. Is any any additional money that goes into uh, the buyouts would be helpful. Voluntary buyouts helps give people a, a price that would incentivize them to uh, to make the move. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Axe. Uh, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Torres, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the destruction of property at the hands of climate change is as much a human disaster as it is a natural disaster. Uh, decisions about the design, construction, and siting often determines the extent of the property damage caused by a climate event. Take as an example the varied impact of California's 2018 wildfires. In 2008, uh, California established rigorous building codes. 51% of the properties built after 2008 went undamaged during the wildfires. By contrast, only 18% of the properties built before 2008 went undamaged. 
Furthermore, according to a 2020 FEMA study, the adoption of the International Building Code and the International Residential Code saves $1.6 billion a year. Is there anyone on the panel who knows what percentage of states and localities have adjusted their building standards to meet the International Building Code and the International Residential Code? Congressman Torres, this is Shelley Patisha. I would be happy to get back with you on that information. I, I, I don't have it at my fingertips right now. And should the government, now I have a policy question, should the government mandate adoption of international building code, international residential code as a condition of receiving federal funds or when it comes to the expenditure of federal funds on infrastructure, particularly housing? Are you directing that at me? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, we need to get everyone to adopt these more stringent codes because not only is it essential to drive down energy use in existing buildings, it's the most cost effective way of reducing climate pollution. And until we have a common set of standards and even the ability of some jurisdictions to take further action beyond, I do uh, work in San Jose, which has adopted a very um, very aggressive building code standard, net zero. Um, we need to do this in order to meet our climate challenge. I, I can't state how urgent this is. And is there anything else that the government can do to ensure the sustainable and equitable design, construction, and siting of housing? Well, I think, oh, sorry. Please go ahead, Steve. Um, Congressman, I, I think that it, it really, if you look at how much money is going out the door by the federal government, there needs to be greater strings attached. I mean, essentially the, the communities and homeowners and states have to do their part as well if they're expecting Uncle Sam and, and citizens around the country to do their part. So I have no problems of tying strings to federal assistance uh, to actually have stronger building codes and build back um, in ways that are more resilient and less vulnerable. Um, and so I think that is a, is a critical area. And if a community or, or individual doesn't want to do that, don't take the money. But apart from the, apart from the adoption of the International Building Code and the International Residential Code, what things should be attached to the expenditure of federal funds? Well, a lot of it comes down to is planning and being ready for these inevitable disasters. I mean, one thing that you find is, is that if you already have a plan in place of, okay, when the disaster occurs, we're going to buy out these particular properties, or we're going to do this particular mitigation action, you have an opportunity, a tragic opportunity, but an opportunity nonetheless to remake your community and less vulnerable. So we should be requiring certain um, plans and policies to be in place. And we should be rewarding communities and states that do more with more assistance and trying to drag along the, the laggards. If I could just build on that, um, I would also say that communities need resources to engage uh, with leaders in the community to get ahead of a disaster and plan in a proactive way. That's why I focus on community-led low-carbon development, because if you have an ability to get uh, the community engaged in order to prevent the damage that is likely to happen, uh, that can do a lot. Say, yeah. And then quickly, I don't know if I have time, but uh, if you could just, both HUD and FEMA have recovery funds programs. If, what, is, what has been your experience with which each of those programs in terms of the ability to access the funds and the flexibility around the expenditure of those funds. Um, uh, Commissioner, I'll, I'll direct the question to you. Congressman, thank you. I was gonna say on international building codes, make sure there's flexibility. You know, we got 50 inches of rain from Harvey and Houston, and that may not be the case everywhere in the country. But look, as much as you can give a direct allocation with accountability, it helps. What we've run into in Houston is us disagreeing with our state partners and then Sometimes the government entity wants extra money to balance that budget on administrative fees. And then we don't get administrative fees and we take it from low income people so we can administer the program that somebody is looking over our shoulder on. That's a great question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Torres. 
Uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gonzalez, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question is for Mr. Ellis. Uh, Mr. Ellis, the Fair Housing Act protects people from discrimination when they're renting or buying a home, getting a mortgage, uh, seeking housing assistance, or engaging in other housing-related related activities. In the aftermath of disaster, several states have been sued over their inequitable or discriminatory al allocations of disaster recovery funds which were found to be in violation of FHA. For example, in 2014, the state of New Jersey settled for 240 million after a HUD investigation found that Black and Latinx residents were disproportionately denied recovery and building assistance and that the state had not conducted sufficient outreach to communities of color, uh, low-income people, and people with limited English proficiency. How does Harris County, Mr. Ellis, how does Harris County work with the state of Texas to ensure that fair housing uh, planning and disaster recovery planning go hand in hand. Congressman, thank you. It, it's a it's a big a challenge. Uh, we have asked our legal department, we've tasked them with making sure that they try and root out any vestiges of discrimination. I mentioned earlier in Texas, we still have that uh, requirement in state law that you get points based on whether or not local officials sign off on putting housing in a certain neighborhood. So it's a big problem. The NIMBY issue is there. I don't think there's as much sensitivity on the state level uh, as there is in local communities. But look, I welcome the renewed interest in fair housing on the federal level, particularly from the new secretary of HUD. I think it's a good thing. Even for those of us who want to do the right thing, it's a challenge in certain right. neighborhoods. And it's good when we can say, you told us we had to do it or we'll get sued. Yeah. What is what is uh, Harris County's latest assessment of fair housing show are the biggest impediments to fair housing and and what is it and what does the county work to mitigate those issues in the administration of CDBG grants funds? Well, start with that uh, requirement that you've got to get sign off uh, from other elected officials. It's also a big challenge for us uh, in disputes with our state partners on this one bedroom, two bedroom policy. You know, if uh, you go in and a house had three bedrooms built and there are only two people left in it, it's the largest investment that family has. GLO is taking the position that you can only go back with two bedrooms. City of Houston decided to put local dollars up to match it. We've not done that wow. on the county level. We're gonna go back and appeal to uh, HUD to overrule the GLO on it. I mentioned earlier when your colleagues asked why were they doing it? Let the chairwoman ask. I think it's because they were worried there wouldn't be enough funds to go around. But it's a big problem in Harris County and other areas. Other big problem for us is protecting the investments you all have given us in housing. So we assume in our region, we got about a billion for the city, a billion city for using billion dollars in the county uh, for housing. We would assume we should get a comparable amount out of CDPG mitigation funds to go and protect uh, that housing. Uh, but so there are a lot of challenges there. Any oversight you all give us, Congressman, any questions you all ask of HUD and on the, to the GLO will be helpful. Thank you. And I yield, and I yield back. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. Uh, let me uh, thank all of our witnesses uh, for their testimony today. This has been a very enlightening uh, hearing. And uh, without uh, any objections, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able. Uh, without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to uh, submit extraneous uh, materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. Uh, I remind members that written questions and materials for the record should be submitted to email address provided to your offices. Uh, unless there's any additional information to come before the committee, uh, this uh, hearing is now adjourned.